Yeah, so first I want to thank the organizer for inviting me here and unfortunately I couldn't be here. Early in the week I was lecturing in cold week and my voice is very low, so hopefully I won't lose it completely by the end of this talk. Uh, so it's Friday and uh, I hope you'll make it. What I'll try to tell you is a proposal for some enumerative invariance which is based on joint work with Dupé, Pavel Putrov, Tumor Buffa and Chikrin Manalescu. So <coughs> it's uh, very much in the spirit of uh, enumerative geometry and um, this will take a big chunk of our uh, hour here. Um, when I was young, when I was in grad school, I was highly influenced by a very nice paper, a set of papers by uh, Yuri Manin and uh, Maxim Kansevich, where they studied curve counting via torus action. Uh, so this was very explicit localization type technique, which led to nice concrete expressions and basically told us what drama and variance for torus, how the Yaos are, and was very influential on later developments. So it's not homological, and uh, what I'm going to tell you is something very similar in spirit. So, but it's uh, it has uh, very hands-on feeling. So my goal is to actually explain it at some or give formulae in the end, which are extremely concrete. So very explicit, just like that localization of Kansevich uh, and Manning for for variety. varieties. Um, what I'll tell you is more a model side. So it's a curve counting of a sort. And it brings naturally questions like, is there some homological story there? Because if anything I'm going to tell you is enumerative. Uh, also, is there a B model side? Is there some mirror symmetry version of what I'll describe? I don't know answers to many of these questions, but uh, hopefully I'll just explain one corner that you can find your way to other things. So, <clears throat> I'm sure many of these elements were discussed before, but just to make sure that they're all on the same page on the beginning because it's uh, late in the week. Let me give you a lightning review of different flavors of enumerative invariants so that we can organize them in a particular general scheme so you know what kind of problems you're trying to solve because it's a novel generalization of uh, various other things. So perhaps the most familiar uh, enumerative invariants, again, I'm going back uh, quite, quite, quite a while, are Gromophyton invariants which deal with uh, stable maps from Riemann surfaces of genus G uh, into uh, symplectic manifold. Uh, typically, we want this to be a collabial manifold. So that's what I'll denote by X. And uh, these maps are naturally labeled by basic topological information. For example, we fix the genus of Riemann surface and uh, we fix the homology class of the image of the surface inside Calabiao. In Gromophyton theory, for some reason, this is always called beta, and uh, we'll, we'll fix that. So then, um, what the, the actual problem is uh, to, to study moduli spaces. That's where hard analysis comes in, at least in the original formulation. Uh, it's, it's a nice uh, equation to for pseudo-holomorphic map. But then the question is, uh, what the moduli space looks like? Is it smooth? Is it compact? That, that's actually where the actual work is. I mean, that's, that's the beef of the subject. So you define uh, the moduli space uh, labeled by all this data, and the choice of Calabia, choice of genus, and choice of the class beta. And um, uh, that's, that's, again, the main chunk of the work, and then you try to say that in the simplest examples where this modular space consists of points, you just count points, possibly with signs, but uh, more generally you define this Gromophyton invariance of genus G and class beta as um, integrals or um, um, over virtual fundamental class or in some other way to uh, kind of overcome the obstacle of uh, having moduli spaces which are difficult or not well defined and so on. So then, once this main char chunk of work is done, you assemble uh, this Gromophyton invariance for individual choice of genus G and class beta into generating series. This is what's usually called uh, Gromophyton potential, so it's basically generating function of such numbers. So here I call these numbers um, Gromophyton again of G and beta. 
Uh, and we introduce uh, two variables uh, throughout the slides. I may change uh, some notation for the variables, but basically one of the variables keeps track of the genus. So here it's denoted by U. And uh, the other variable keeps track of the homology class uh, to which the surfaces are mapped, and namely this beta is conjugate to variable A. So that's just a formal, both of them are formal variables which keep track of genus and then homology class. So now we got ourselves a function, at least a kind of formal expression, which is written as, as uh, exponential of the power series. Physicists usually, um, when, when the, the basic theories on physics, uh, this potential plays the role of a free energy, and physicists usually prefer to put it in the exponent. So this generating function is exponential of the series. And so far, it, it's, it's very formal. So you've got yourself a function which depends on one variable which has to do with genus counting and, uh, and as many variables as dimension of second Betty number of your Calabiao. And the uh, natural question is, what kind of function is it? I mean, what does it look like and, and, and so on. So anyway, this is again a very uh, standard problem. It has a very, very long history and it's going to be prototyped for many of the things that uh, I'll, I'll try to show you today. There will be several variants of this problem, that's why I want to make sure that I'll review the, the basics first. <coughs> so, um, conjecture uh, is that this uh, potential, or this function exponential of the gram of and potential is related to another set of uh, enumerative invariants uh, called either Gilbert Komarvafa or Donaldson Thomas invariants. <coughs> so, this goes back in the 90s, especially the late 90s, uh, which involves um, two exponentiations. So one is where you take the genus counting parameter, here it was denoted by u, and exponentiate that fellow, denote the new variable by q, for example. Uh, but <coughs> there is another exponentiation which is already hiding in, in this uh, z Gromov-Witten, which involved exponential of Gromov-Witten potential. So the claim, according to this uh, conjecture, I'll have more to say about it, and what follows is that if you use these two exponentials in relating left-hand side and right-hand side, then the right-hand side, viewed as now series in Q in this variable which is exponential of our genus counting parameter, and the same variable A that counts the homology class, will have actually integer coefficients. And these integer coefficients have their own meaning, their own purpose in life. This can be defined completely independently uh, and are called Donaldson Thomas, or again in physics literature, these are Gupokumarvata type of So they're labeled uh, naturally by the same type of data. So if right hand side should be equal to left hand side, we shouldn't lose any information. So they still depend on uh, one integer, which is analog of genus counting. Here it's n, and it accompanies this, this single parameter uh, called q. And uh, there is still dependence on that. So we still have invariants uh, both here dt and comma beta, which depend on homology class beta and uh, this, this new number n, which plays the role of genus in uh, Gromov-Witten theory. <coughs> so this sort of relation um, between um, um, Gromov-Witten type invariants, which are naturally originating in symplectic geometry, and uh, some integral sort of uh, invariants have a precursor. So this relation I'm showing you came up more or less at the turn of the century uh, in late 90s, early 2000s. But way before that, in fact, about maybe four or five years before that, uh, Cliff Taubes was studying something analogous in the context of uh, symplectic manifolds of lower dimension, namely a four manifold. So he considered <coughs> Gromov invariants of symplectic manifolds, which are unlike Gromov Witten invariants, count uh, embedded surfaces. So they actually count something very concrete and uh, produce integer numbers. They are actually very hard to compute. But the technique is. Uh, very similar to the one used in Gromov-Witten theory and produces integer invariants. On the other hand, uh, Cliff studied how these are related to integer invariants produced by gauge theory. So in this case, it's uh, Seibert-Witten gauge theory. It's uh, a theory of connection on U1, 
bundled over four manifolds, symplectic four manifold, uh, along with the choice of um, a spinner here denoted by M, section of the spin bundle, tensored with some line bundle of some chunk class. And uh, these two variables, uh, which, which we have on the four manifold, namely the choice of connection A and uh, the spinner M, should obey two equations. Basically, we have two variables, we should impose two equations, and uh, they're shown here on, on the slide. So one is a version of self-duality equation, which is corrected by a nonlinear term involving the square of the spinner, and uh, the equation for the spinner, the second equation is basically the Dirac equation. So this is a set of cyberquitten PDEs on, on a four manifold, and in that story, there is again a very sophisticated machinery of doing pretty much the same thing that we reviewed in Bromo Pitton theory. You start with your nice equations, that's the easy part. Then you try to define moduli spaces and good, nice cases. In fact, which happens quite often here in Cypher Quitton setup. Uh, this moduli space is just a set of isolated points. You count them with plus minus sign, you get your number. So that's how Cypher Quitton invariants are defined. And uh, Cliff um, uh, studied this uh, in the context, again, of four manifolds and found a very nice relation between Gromov invariants uh, and, and uh, cyber Quitten invariants relating symplectic geometry and gauge theory on one side and, and the other. So this, uh, the, the reason I tell you this uh, story, which uh, goes back to late 90s, is that, again, at the turn of the century, there was uh, precisely this relation between Gromov Quitten invariants and Donaldson Thomas invariants which you can view in the same spirit. So the way Donaldson and Thomas envisioned their invariants, or the, the way the original paper is written, it's very much in the language of analysis or analytic techniques, similar to those used in PDEs or in cyber Quitman theory. You again formulate a gauge theory, in this case on a six manifold, which can be symplectic. And uh, you again count solutions to PDEs, in this case, taking advantage of either symplectic form or color form if your six manifold has complex structure. And again, you try to count solutions, you produce some integer numbers. And um, these are the ones that uh, we saw a couple of slides earlier related to uh, integrality or rewriting of Gromov written potential after exponentiation. <coughs> and it has, again, many of the same features of the relation between Gromov invariants and cyber Quitten invariants that the Taubes discussed because in both cases it involves abelian gauge theory. It's, uh, it's uh, you're counting solutions to some interesting equations for your one gauge connection to the certain condition. Uh, more recently, so this was original kind of point of view of Donaldson and Thomas, I guess, for Donaldson this was very natural, especially uh, in view of Donaldson theory and so on, but um, very quickly uh, this was reformulated for Calabiaus in terms of algebraic geometry, where instead of analysis, we use algebraic geometry to count the integer numbers, and again, the same story uh, evolves once again. We introduce uh, basic objects, we ask what is their <coughs> moduli space, and uh, then we try to perform some sort of <coughs> integral over virtual fundamental class of that moduli space. So in this case, the moduli space involves ideal sheaves. So you, again, uh, in, in a Gromov Witten setup, you would naturally fix the genus of your curve that maps onto Calabiao as well as the class, homology class. Here, if you're counting ideal sheaves, uh, the rank is one, so we're dealing again with U1 gauge theory, roughly speaking. But then you also can fix uh, the churn class and that defines topological data. So um, N uh, and beta are part of the churn class of this uh, ideal sheaf associated or supported on uh, complex dimension one uh, subscheme inside um, your color DL. Um, and then you define the moduli space, uh, that part is very similar. So the moduli space very uh, naively is more or less uh, Hilbert schemes, uh, Hilbert scheme of curves inside Calabiao. This, uh, this can be made very concrete and simple situations. If your Calabiao is very simple, this is literally the case. More generally, it's uh, kind of modeled on, on that. And then again, you uh, can 
go ahead and define the same type of uh, numbers. In this case, these are actually integer numbers because they're counting, again, something very concrete uh, rather than stable maps which have denominators. So when this story came, came about, uh, many people, including, for example, Raul Pandre Pande, Andrei Lokhankov, and others, uh, made uh, the point that this Donaldson-Thomas theory is uh, in many ways better behaved than, than Brahma-Fitton theory. So when they would give talks, they would, at this point, roughly in the talk, they would say that it has much better obstruction deformation theory than, than Brahma-Fitton theory. <coughs> so uh, it quickly became a standard tool in enumerative geometry and uh, Part of the relation uh, between Gromov Witten invariance and, and Donaldson invariance uh, owes to the development of this theory. Uh, here, the invariance, the numerical invariance that we're counting, uh, from the physics point of view, naturally come as early characteristics of uh, what physicists call spaces of BPS states. So, uh, this space, uh, which I call HBPS, is a uh, space which is uh, B. Two, where B2 is the second Betty number of the LIDL, plus two graded, so it has a bunch of gradings, and uh, telling, taking all the characteristic with respect to one of the gradings, let's call it homological grading, you get a numerical invariant. Uh, but this also suggests that there could be some sort of refinement uh, when you not, you, you, instead of trying to take all the characteristic, you try to somehow keep in mind information about this entire space of BPS states, or consider the homology rather than other characteristic. So this is uh, the notion of uh, so-called refined invariance. So in this enumerative story, again, there'll be very many different turns and flavors. So I'm giving you this overview to organize it in some sort of table. And uh, one piece of the information in, in this table is uh, refinement, which uh, in the case of closed invariance that I'm reviewing right now, <coughs> involves uh, basically studying cohomology of that moduli space uh, that, that we introduced uh, of ideal sheaves, uh, or in physics language, this is uh, the, this uh, space of BPS state. Uh, of course, in more general situation, this is not a good invariant. It's, it's, it's not invariant of anything. It would jump and behave uh, discontinuously. In fact, uh, how it jumps and so on is closely related to uh, various wall crossing formulae and uh, Mativic Donaldson Thomas invariants developed by uh, Jan and Maxine here in the audience. Uh, but in some cases, uh, when in particular when Calabiao is rigid, it doesn't have complex structure deformations, it's believed that uh, there is a well defined notion of such refined invariants, and in some cases it was fairly well developed. So you can ask for Again, some refined information, or no pun intended, refinement of of the Thomas invariants. <coughs> um, in particular, uh, when Calabiao is uh, toric, um, so such Calabiaos are uh, non-compact, but uh, they still provide very nice uh, laboratory for for counting things. You can express uh, this uh, refined invariance in terms of counting of. Uh, skew three-dimensional partitions. I'll, I'll come back to it later, but it takes us back from something rather abstract and subtle, this refinement is rather delicate thing to define properly, uh, to the realm of uh, nice and concrete combinatorics. Now, th this was roughly one line of development, but another generalization uh, or direction in which you can kind of push gromov witten theory is uh, by introducing uh, Lagrangian submanifolds and requiring uh, your Riemann surfaces to have boundary on a Lagrangian submanifold. That's a very nice boundary condition for um, pseudo holomorphic map. And this leads to completely different uh, or very similar uh, story. Uh, it is different but similar to, to what I described before, where the goal is to study analogous maps from genus G surfaces in your uh, target space in your Calabi L X, uh, but now equipped with additional data, in particular with the choice of Lagrangian submanifold that I'm gonna call L. So this um, problem uh, is now much more interesting and more delicate. 
uh, it involves also additional uh, information, for example, just like in the case of closed chromophyton invariants, we had to fix plus beta, that was telling us where the curve lands in the color E of X. Now we also have to choose a class in H1, I'll call it gamma on this slide, the notation may change later, um, where it lands in the first homology of a Lagrangian submanifold. So think of it as Lagrangian submanifold may have many non-trivial and contractible cycles, and boundary of sigma may land in different homology classes. So <coughs> now this um, moduli space, um, which you can try to define by um, analogous uh, methods to, to the closed case, depends on all these choices. It depends uh, on choice of color BL, Lagrangian, the class in H2, relative Lagrangian, that's still called beta, and uh, numbers and I, which tell us uh, how various boundary components of our Riemann surface sigma uh, seed in, in uh, first homology of Lagrangians and manifold. So this moduli space is uh, nasty, uh, or much worse, uh, much more complicated compared to nicer moduli spaces that we saw in the closed case. So in the usual Gromophyton theory, it still takes uh, some effort to understand uh, compactification of these moduli spaces. In Donaldson-Thomas theory, Again, um, they're slightly better in some sense with respect to obstruction deformation theory, but it still requires some effort. This, this is much more advanced. So, so if you want a real challenge, uh, then the, 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 this is super challenging. And uh, so far, has not been properly developed, uh, even though naively what you would want to say is that basically gromov britain invariants for such open invariants, including Lagrangians inside Colored Bial, are analogous to what we had before. And uh, this has been actually quite interesting subject um, for at least 20 years, if not more, related to uh, mirror symmetry, now in the context of homological mirror symmetry, because this Lagrangian submanifolds, of course, are objects in Fukai category. And um, it's very natural to study this open version of uh, A model or um, Gromophyton theory. And some of the pioneering work here was done, for example, by Sheldon Katz and Willy Salu. Uh, I think, I don't remember if you were a grad student or a postdoc at the time, but grad student, yeah. So that, 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 that was really uh, like a while ago. And uh, by now, of course, that there is more and more development. But this is basically the problem we're trying to solve. So, we're, so uh, when I say open and variance, I really refer uh, in that sense of uh, open Riemann surfaces which have boundary and we're studying a uh, relative problem of uh, <coughs> studying eigenmaps or counting something which involves both color Diao and Lagrangian submanifold L. So this is pretty challenging and again uh, essentially the, the, the question is how to, to approach it or to develop various methods. So everything I said so far, uh, I can summarize in this kind of rough table, which uh, on one direction uh, tells you about uh, whether we're talking about closed or open invariants. Uh, this basically is part of the information whether Riemann surface has boundary or not. And then uh, various columns tell you about different uh, types of invariants that you can study in a given context. So uh, as in closed Gromophyton theory, we can study either stable maps. So this will give us something non-integral. This will be in general rational numbers at the level of counting. Um, there'll be something integer, such as Gupo Komarvafa or Donaldson Thomas invariants, which are counting real objects, real solutions. So that's why they're actually integer. Uh, they're counting these objects with signs, plus and minus. So if you try to undo the signs or define something more refined, you know by pun intended get refined invariants which in the context of um, um, topological vertex, which I'll describe to you next, can be obtained using equivalent localization. And there is a parallel story again uh, with open invariants where you can <coughs> either try to define the problem by counting stable maps, again, that's challenging, or you can try to define some integral kind of invariants which do involve color uh, and Lagrangian submanifold and produce something integral. 
Um, so I'm not sure you could call them open Donaldson Thomas invariants or open BPS invariants. And that's precisely uh, the problem that we're trying to solve. So uh, the, the title or proposal that I'll make uh, today it involves precisely this kind of invariants, which are, on the one hand, share all the critical properties of Donaldson Thomas invariants for, uh, in the closed case, for example, integrality will be very crucial to us. Um, but in the same time, they will deal with a situation that I described a moment ago where you have not just Calabiao, but rather Calabiao in the choice of Lagrange and submanifold, and uh, we are basically studying. So that they'll be related in exactly the same way to open Bromofitin invariants uh, that, that count maps from Riemann surfaces with boundary. So then you can also try to consider uh, refinement of this open invariance, and in some particular set up this uh, has connections to, to various node homologies that uh, Kuhlman Buffer and Albert Schwartz uh, and I studied uh, quite a while ago. So this is basically the problem, that's the challenge, to try to fill in uh, this uh, one of the corners in the stable that has to do with open Donaldson Thomas invariance, namely uh, put more, more examples there. Uh, this is something that uh, again, does not exist uh, in, in full generality, and uh, the question to which I'll settle is find examples or classes of examples where it's computable and, and concrete, so we can hopefully learn and develop more general theory. So that's, that's the challenge. If you know more examples beyond what I'm going to mention in the talk, please come and tell me, and I'll be delighted to hear about it. Again, integer invariants which involve uh, maps into a pair of Calabiao and Lagrange. <coughs> Another aspect which naturally fits in this, uh, in what I told you, both in the case of open and closed invariants, is uh, resurgent analysis. And this has to do with this uh, exponential uh, change of variables and change of the function that you're studying that, that I mentioned earlier. Uh, namely, the Gromov-Witten invariants involve one counting parameter, previously I called it U here to emphasize that it's small, I'll call it H bar, or you can think of epsilon if you wish. But this is not the right parameter for Donaldson-Thomas series. So that's written in terms of a completely different variable, which is exponential of either H bar or epsilon, or what you call it. So therefore, from the viewpoint of function, that this uh, Z that that's supposed to be uh, expressing both right hand side and left hand side, what we're trying to do, we're trying to change the domain of expansion of this function from zero to one or vice versa. Because if epsilon or h bar is small, then q is near one, so that's where Gromov-Hitton expansion is most meaningful. Again, it may be a formal series, but uh, whatever it is, it's, it's near q equals one. On the other hand, when we write sum of uh, over n going from 0 to infinity, q to the n, and some coefficients, dtn, this type of expansion obviously makes sense near q equals 0. So when we're trying to relate the two expressions, we're basically trying to transfer this domain of expansion from neighborhood of point q equals 0 to the neighborhood of point q equals 1. So this kind of transfer of information uh, is precisely uh, the question that's uh, attacked or addressed to some extent by resurgent analysis. So this is about analytic structures or properties of the function that we're trying to analyze. And it involves, for example, in um, one direction, Borel resummation, <coughs> and um, is active area of research right now. So again, this is kind of forefront of or interesting subject mathematically and has many applications in physics. This is also uh, basically one of the main topics of uh, your C grant, which uh, and here we have several PIs, including Maxine, Young, and uh, Bertrand, uh, devoted precisely to this sort of question. And uh, it fits very well in, in this program because it also involves trying to very explicitly, very concretely, we write information about Bromo-Fitton series in terms of this integral Donaldson-Thomas invariance. So in some sense, uh, for the rest, for what I'm going to tell you later, uh, this point of view, or this slide, is perhaps the most crucial, 
that uh, you have to keep in mind because it uh, sums up all the information. So here, uh, in terms of gromophyton variants, we get one series, its coefficients are not integer. Again, this accounting stable maps. In the case of closed uh, invariants, this is precisely MNOP conjecture uh, by Maulik, Nekarsov, Akunkov, and Pandriapande, also proposed by Kupokumar Bafa in a very similar setting. Um, on the right hand on the left hand side, we have a different expansion of Q to the N, uh, some Q series, uh, which has integer coefficients, and these are Donaldson <coughs> invariants. So uh, the goal of um, today, uh, or what I'm going to tell you next, is try to build analogous picture and make it as concrete as possible, at least in some class of examples for open invariants. There is actually one context where this problem is solved, and uh, you don't need me or uh, any of my collaborators, and it has, again, fairly old history. That's the context where Caleb Yao is Toric, and uh, your choice of Lagrangian is consistent or very nicely compatible with the Torx, or with the Torx action on, on Caleb Yao. So this is illustration of such situation where this is a toric diagram of O minus one plus O minus one bundle over CP1, or again sum of two line bundles over uh, CP1 if you wish. There are uh, two such uh, Lagrangians and manifolds shown. Uh, what the dashed line and the solid line is a projection of a Lagrangian submanifold to the toric base. So this three-dimensional picture shows the, the base of the toric manifold. And in such cases, uh, computation of this open invariance, uh, precisely with all the desired information that I listed in my wish list, already exists. So um, it can be done by nice combinatorics of counting uh, three-dimensional boxes or partitions. So in the next few slides, I'll try to review this combinatorics because it gives a very concrete answer to the problem that we're trying to solve. So it actually does produce uh, for you Q series with integer coefficients <coughs> and uh, these coefficients can be interpreted as counting something, maybe as open Donaldson Thomas invariants. And um, again it has all the all the desired properties in particular relation to open chromophyton invariants as computed in first uh, original works that I mentioned earlier. Um, right. So <coughs> uh, counting um, things are uh, is easy and fun, uh, as the uh, previous slide illustrates. So uh, this is the uh, beginning of kind of um, counting, which is uh, counting of two-dimensional partitions or young tableaus. So if you haven't seen this, this is uh, a lot of fun. You basically uh, try to produce a generating series, count uh, all young tableaus or partitions here denoted by pi, and uh, put them in a generating series. Uh, Q to the uh, size of the partition. So therefore, prefactor of Q, that the coefficient in front of Q to some power, basically will be the number of young tableaus of that size. So this is a very classical uh, old problem, which gives rise in a very nice Q series, which has integer coefficients, just as we uh, try to wish for in this much more general context. And uh, Coefficients are 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 7, and so on. And as the picture illustrates, these are basically numbers of young tableaus or two-dimensional partitions of this size. So this has a natural generalization, which also can be expressed as infinite product, very much like uh, an error function um, given by this infinite other product uh, on the previous slide, except that uh, instead of taking the product of 1 minus q to the power k, you also raise this to the k power. And again, everything sits in the denominator, so you expand it to the q series, you get now much faster growth of coefficients of q to the n, or this exponent, and uh, what this tells you is how uh, the number of three-dimensional partitions, plane partitions, grows uh, with the size of the partition. So that's given by McMahon function. So again, something fun and simple, and uh, what we want, or what I want, is have answers in as fun and as simple form as, as, as this. So the problem uh, can be slightly generalized to get precisely to this refined endurance that I mentioned earlier. If what you do, you slice your uh, three-dimensional partition, or you look at it as sequence of uh, 2D 
uh, two-dimensional Young tableaus. And depending on which diagonal you sit on, you count it with either Q or T. So this leads to expression which has two parameters, Q and T. So now the new variable T is uh, responsible for this refinement or um, motivic version of donaldson thomas invariance. So <coughs> here you can easily see that this double product now over I and J specializes to McMahon function if I set Q equals T. So that's again a fun exercise. And uh, what we're counting is called skew three-dimensional partitions. And the final uh, generalization that I want to make is to allow these partitions not just sit in the corner of the room, not in the octon, but rather uh, extend all the way to the boundary along one of the three directions of the uh, this positive uh, quadrant or octant thinking about this as a toric diagram of C3. So what we're studying here in this model is a basic Calabial, namely complex three-dimensional space viewed as a toric manifold. And it has uh, three uh, axes where uh, two-dimensional torus degenerates. These are precisely this axis, x, y, and z, if you think about this as an octon. And along those directions, you can have asymptotic boundary conditions which uh, tell you that the, the profile of your three-dimensional uh, young tableau has to approach uh, one of the two-dimensional young tableaus uh, chosen on one of the three uh, transfer slices. So counting such objects also leads to natural uh, partition function, counting partitions, again, no pun intended. It depends on Q and T in a very similar way as the previous one, but it also depends on choice of uh, these three boundary conditions. So this partition function here denoted by P and introduced by, by these people or studied by these people is what we really call topological vertex and uh, basically addresses the problem that we posed for counting open Donaldson-Thomas invariants in a toric setting. So that's the basic ingredient from which you can now try to glue more general toric manifolds. And as long as you're interested in Lagrangians which are compatible with the torus action, you're done. So at least on this class of manifolds, the problem is solved. And um, the reason I bring it up, or uh, I use it as a motivation, is that, again, from now on, you can start building more general toric diagrams. Uh, so you can have a toric diagram representing um, one of such uh, topological vertices. But you can also glue them together in various combinations, such as the one we saw before. And you can start composing them, making them more and more interesting. So this becomes like a Lego. So the reason people, especially young researchers, uh, graduate students like this, is it's very tangible. You can actually play with this. And uh, what I told you about counting partitions is very concrete, very explicit, and can be assembled uh, as Lego pieces into more complicated, interesting problems. Sorry, can you say again what's the orange thing? What's the orange? I mean, I, I get the blue part has to be asymptotic to the... Yeah, the right. So the orange thing is what you have to put in addition to kind of uh, the, the baseline. So this profile here illustrates that there are some boundary conditions that your partition is supposed to have uh, as you go uh, asymptotically in one of the directions. And as in the usual partition, there are inequalities which say that uh, you can go up yeah, but so not so down. This represents a generic partition. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. It basically represents additional stuff that you have to put in. And when you count uh, number of partitions Q to the size, you don't count the white stuff. You only count the orange stuff. So you basically remove this. Otherwise, it would be infinity. So. Yeah. If you have any questions at any point, uh, feel free to ask. So the question that we were trying to face, or in, in fact, I was hoping to address uh, back when uh, Melissa and I were at Harvard, and I was young and ambitious and hopeful that, that there'll be lots of progress in this direction, uh, and we'll have lots of examples like this. So it, it seemed, at least back then, with uh, all the hype of the excitement, that uh, there should be a lot uh, of, of Q-series produced by counting things and so on, but it didn't happen. So what I'm asking now, or the problem I'll try to address at least in some class of examples, is uh, can we define some family of Lego-type basic building blocks like this 
which addresses uh, open Chrome of Ritten or Donaldson Thomas counting, at least in some cases. It doesn't have to be all Calabi-Yaus, but it, it may be some decent step. Uh, what I also want or prefer is something tangible, something easy to compute uh, that you can explain to a graduate student or better yet to undergraduate student because counting these partitions is really fun and, and exciting. So that's my next requirement. But it should be uh, interesting to play with. It. it shouldn't be super difficult or I have to explain complicated uh, details of compactification of moduli spaces in order to, to compute this, this invariance. Uh, and um, Hopefully, it connects to some new things uh, that will shed light on how to develop or understand either the structure of this open Donaldson Thomas invariance or uh, develop the theory uh, from the first principle at a fundamental level, maybe even define this moduli spaces, because quite often having these connections to additional fields actually helps to uh, shed light on, on what we're trying to formulate. I want to emphasize again that. Unfortunately, at the present pro uh, stage, this open DT invariants, uh, which are expected to exist, they don't exist. So we don't, we don't really have this here. So that's, that's what I'll try to um, address uh, today. And the class of examples that I'll try to consider are of the following type. So we'll take um, a neighborhood of a generic Lagrangian submanifold on a Calabial. So <coughs> imagine that. Uh, you have a Lagrangian submanifold, some three-dimensional now real manifold in Calabi out space. It's uh, a simple theorem, or uh, reasonably simple theorem, that uh, its neighborhood always looks like a total space of the cotangent bundle. So gener generally, uh, they, they you'll have maybe more complicated geometry of Calabi out, but let's just focus on this neighborhood of Lagrangian submanifold and take that as, as, a, as a model. Uh, again, I don't know generalizations of what I'm going to tell you, but perhaps like uh, with this uh, topological verdicts, you may even try to hope to marry the two, to glue them together, but as you can see, this is a rather different family. So previously X was toric and L was compatible with the toric section. Now X is uh, T star of M3, and L, Lagrangian, will actually be a choice of uh, the zero section or perhaps multiple copies of the zero section. So <coughs> multiple copies is uh, something that's very natural in the context of uh, homological mirror symmetry because in Foucault category, the objects are not just Lagrangians, there are Lagrangians with a choice of local system, and the rank of this local system is basically this multiplicity that I call N on this one. So the question is, what do we get in this case? Um, by the way, um, I should have made a remark going back to, to here, uh, so this is simplest toric Calabiao, uh, which is C3, uh, three-dimensional complex space. And notice that it doesn't have any H2, so there is no beta, there is nothing to worry about where this uh, maps uh, from the drum fitting point you will land. So as a result, we only get a function of Q, which is counting roughly genus, or, or um, part of the charm character, but not related to the H2 of the Calabiao, because H2 is absent. So as a result, we only get a function in one variable q, and something similar will happen in this class of examples that I want to consider here. Uh, in particular, if your three manifold has first Betty number, then there will be nothing, no B2 in the space for, uh, for the maps to wind on. So we'll, we'll just, so we should expect that whatever the answer is, it better be expansion in q with hopefully integer coefficient. So that's the so this problem actually was uh, looked at by many people, including uh, Witten in early days of the subject. So uh, it's called Open A model, in, in, uh, or it was called Open A model in the 90s. And he quickly pointed out that uh, just like in the case of C3, when you don't have actual non-trivial maps into uh, C3 because everything is contractible, here again everything is also contractible. And in some sense, the answer should localize to the boundary of the moduli space, which is actually coming from compactification, and it involves degenerate curves. Degenerate curves are basically graphs, and he was trying to interpret these graphs as Feynman graphs of, of, of something. So um, 
it's in spirit very similar to the case of C3, where again, uh, problem should simplify in some sense because uh, contributions come from degenerate maps. So then, uh, this is similar to what I told you before, but uh, in slightly more detail, we can introduce this open version of Bravo Quicken Potential. That's again a generating function which is trying to count this, this maps. So this is Brown Quitten side, which again has one parameter which is a uh, genus counting parameter. Here it's called GS. Uh, this is for, for so called string coupling. Uh, then uh, again, we don't have beta, but we have all kinds of uh, numbers uh, here denoted by, um, by C, C, I, which tell us uh, in uh, what homology class of the Lagrangian uh, I or J is boundary component of our map lens. So remember in the beginning I told you that an open case you have besides beta, analog of beta that counts uh, winding in H1. So even though we don't have beta, just like in topological verdicts, we actually have lots of H1 uh, data that we have to record and the corresponding variables here, which is probably hard to see, are called AI. So they could be interpreted as uh, holonomies of uh, rank N local system on, on our uh, Lagrangian set manifold. So here I make the observation uh, that this number is this Gromov Fitton invariance uh, or open version of them should vanish if. Uh, the total sum of CIs is, uh, uh, is not zero. Uh, this is again by the assumption that there are no two cycles in the ambient geometry. Uh, in other words, that we expect, so I'll only tell you about cases where uh, there, are, there is no non-trivial uh, two cycle unwinding, so that we only expect a Q-series, not series and more variables, analogous to topological vertex. And um, yeah, this is a remark that from the viewpoint of uh, <coughs> uh, this local system on a Lagrangian submanifold, which is natural object again in Foucault category, the, parameter, the parameters uh, AI that count winding of our boundary components can naturally be interpreted as holonomies of, uh, of, of uh, flat connection on this Lagrangian submanifold. Sorry, but how, how can this intersection bound any sort of one where it's exact? So are you, are you still thinking at it as inside some ambient cloudy eye? Yes. Uh, if you wish, you can separate them a little bit so, uh, so you can think of very thin bands, such as annuli and, and uh, analogous graphs. So for but example... This curve escape the neighborhood in which it's simply not It escapes to where? Sorry. So I'm just wondering if you're thinking about this Lagrangian boundary condition as still inside, not just this standard neighborhood, but but as sitting inside some ambient syntax that is Well, uh, the X, the ambient manifold is just total space of Catangent bundle to answer. It's probably it's a question about the interpretation of the count. Definition of the generating function. So it's really a question. And at this level of precision, maybe we should just go continue. Yeah. Um, so, from the viewpoint of definition of this counting, it's, uh, you can think about it in several ways. Again, uh, this goes back to Whitman basically in the mid 90s, where he, one, one per perspective is that it comes from the boundary or uh, compactification of the moduli space of such maps um, where you include degenerate maps. And, and these are very thin strips. So you can have Raymond surface, for example, several boundary components. Think about annulus, for instance. So uh, if you separate, say, two copies of your Lagrangian and it has, uh, for instance, some H1, you can have two boundary components which go around this H1 element and are represented by mirrors. Uh, by, by any line, uh, thin, very thin patterns. So this is a typical simple model for, for what is being counted in the end. So, so can I ask, about the left DTNs you're going to define? Yes. Right? Okay. Yeah, so, uh, right, so the goal of the slide indeed, as Ardana is asking, um, 
morally, I told you what the right hand side is. Again, I don't know how to define it properly, and I leave it this to you, and hopefully what I'm pre going to present will be connectable to, to this definition. But the goal, even if that was uh, possible, is to define the left hand side completely independently. In terms of counting something simple, in terms of doing something simple, very much like in, in counting partitions, uh, even if you know about this research and analysis, which allows you to transfer data from left-hand side to right-hand side and vice versa, you don't want to go through this every single time, or at least this is not the level that we can explain to graduate or undergraduate student. So therefore, we want to define the left-hand side uh, independently, at least in this class, for example. So that's basically uh, what, what's going to happen next, and that's precisely the proposal, at least in this class of examples, for what this open VT invariants should be. Uh, again, they will produce a result which just depends on Q because we're counting essentially degenerate maps from the Gromov-Witten perspective. And it will be general enough, so it gives a vast uh, territory of examples to play with, experiment, and uh, just like topological vertex could be used as a building block or a multi set of building blocks that can be composed like Lego and you can play with them and produce something concrete and explicit. So simplicity or concreteness is one of the desired goals of this story. So the choices of our setup will be labeled by graphs. So think of this as analog of this combinatorial data of topological vertex. Graphs which consist of vertices, edges that connect uh, the vertices, and also decoration, namely at every vertex you assign an integer, um, which I call AI. So this is one example of a graph, you can pick any other. Uh, the richness of this class of examples comes from richness of or different choices of graphs. That you can make. Result kind of fold uh, is not on this class of examples. So that's why I'm saying it's orthogonal. It's actually a completely different family. So give an example. Uh, well, I'll, I'll give uh, an example in a second. For one class of examples could be, for instance, uh, choose uh, T star of lens space or at least here. So that, that would be in this class of examples. Okay. What will be kind of T star? Yes, yeah. That's, that's what I said on the previous and slide. And so the yeah. will be always zero section? Yes. Yeah, so of, which means it's of multiple points. Anti-symplectic evolution, so everything will degenerate. Yes, yeah, that's, that's precisely what this slide says, exactly. So this is, again, a very general class of model, but also, of course, from the viewpoint of open DT theory, if, if it should be developed, it's still rather limited, so that's why um, it, it's not, of course, very far from solving the big challenge. But at least in this case, we have a very concrete and tangible proposal. Uh, again, I don't know how it uh, checks with open chrome of it and counting, uh, aside from simple cases such as T star of S3 and lens spaces, which can be indeed uh, checked using technique that Melissa and others have developed. So we didn't check it in great generality, <coughs> but this is proposal that passes some time. So again, the class of models will be built out of edges and vertices. So the Lego building blocks are, are here on the slide. And uh, my job is basically to tell you how to assign the weights or counting based on vertices and, and edges. So it will be a very simple combinatorial model, some sort of statistical model analogous to topological verdicts or counting partitions uh, that produces an answer. So that's, that's the goal. So the expression is uh, very concrete, uh, but I want to emphasize maybe just uh, like basic ingredients and building blocks if you need explicit formulae which are here you can also look at the paper but um, more, more importantly uh, what's going to happen is the following to every vertex will associate discrete variable n and a continuous variable x or here denoted by z such that uh, will sum over n in integer range and integrate over z's on a unit circle so to every vertex, there will be sum and integration. You can write it in many other ways, converting integration into a sum, if you wish, using um, <coughs> basically contracting dual of, of uh, C star in which Z is lead. 
then the integrand, just like in topological vertex, will be assembled from basic building blocks. So to every vertex, you'll also shade some factor, which depends on this uh, summation and integration variables. To every edge, you associate some factor. And then you basically compose them <coughs> as, as Lego pieces in something compact, closed, closed form. So <coughs> this is uh, very concrete, very tangible. And uh, since I'm here with the computer, uh, my next job is to create this uh, slideshow and, and show you that it really works. So it's uh, as concrete and explicit that even Mathematica can handle it. But again, it's, it's in the form of concrete sum and integral that um, graduate students, the graduate student uh, also probably can, can handle. So um, this is Mathematica code, which uh, does the calculation. So first it takes uh, this graph as an input and uh, goes over this integration and summation procedure that I described for you and speeds out the answer. So maybe let me run it uh, to uh, get the answer in the end. So this is uh, the outcome. Uh, it's as expected up to overall power of Q. It's a Q series with integer coefficients and uh, obviously integer powers of Q. And um, you can play with this, again, it's, it satisfies at least this criterion that it's very explicit and tangible. But now, next question is, uh, what, what can we say about this answer? Uh, what, what, why is it interesting? And as I'll try to explain in the remaining 10 minutes, it's actually interesting from several other viewpoints. Not only from the viewpoint of enumerative geometry of these local uh, neighborhoods of Lagrangians, but also from, it connects to different subjects uh, and sometimes in a rather surprising way, which we didn't expect at all, and it would be good to understand. So first of all, let me, yeah. What is this a result of? Oh, this is result of computing this uh, uh, series or this uh, open DT kind of invariant, so let's call it uh, Z hat, for very particular input uh, data, which is, consists of, of this graph here minus 2, minus 3, minus 7, minus 1. So it's a graph with four vertices, it's just an example. If you give me some other graph, like, I don't know, a thinking diagram of E8, uh, with eight vertices connected in a certain way, labeled by minus 2 or plus 2, and so on, you can compute the answer. Is it a plumbing of uh, potential models? Yeah, I'll, I'll, yeah. I, I didn't want to use this word yet, but uh, I'll, I'll use it uh, very, very soon. <laughs> That's so, um, right, uh, it, it's just a, an illustration of uh, how, how this computation works, uh, that this formula that I'm proposing to you is, is not some nonsense, it's very tangible and very concrete, it's, it's actually easy to compute. So let me do a couple of changes though, so let me change this to a completely different graph, which consists uh, of even different number of vertices, for example something like this. So I'll ask Mathematica to forget the calculation. Maybe I'll just copy the answer. Um, I'll put it here. I will save it and uh, see see what happens. So that's the, now I'm trying to compute it for a completely different graph, uh, which looks uh, as follows. So I, I change this uh, into minus two minus one, minus three, minus eight, and minus one. So it's a completely different <coughs> story. And um, yeah, for some reason, Mathematica always takes long when it's, um, it's a bug of Mathematica 11 that it takes longer on the second run. But anyway, here is the answer. So uh, this is a new picture of a graph. And it can put some basic data like adjacency metrics and so on, and then spits out the answer. So uh, those of you sitting closer can see that the answer is actually the same as in the previous case. So uh, we got changed the input data, but we got the same answer. So it's not quite correct to say that we produce uh, some Q series for every input data. We produce uh, say, answer of Q-series for equivalence classes of input data. In fact, for equivalence classes such that these two graphs sit on the same equivalence class. <coughs> so in other words, 
Uh, more generally, you can play with this and discover very quickly that if you have a vertex labeled by some A, for example, uh, you can replace it by a vertex labeled by A by the plus one or minus one, connect it to another vertex labeled by plus minus one, such that the signs are correlated. So, <coughs> uh, when Mike Friedman saw this uh, example, he said that this is the quickest way to learn Kirby calculus because what we just observed, or what this relation is, it's one of the three or four basic relations in Kirby calculus. And um, the reason uh, it comes up is because the problem that, that we're studying actually also nicely connects to topology. So it often happens, and I'm studying it uh, so far, that if you study enumerative geometry, of something which looks like local neighborhood of a surface of a three manifold, like in our case, the problem localizes to gauge theorem of complex surface or uh, something, some kind of TQFT on a three manifold. And uh, in such setups, which are kind of local enumerative problems, you often get nice connections to either Donaldson theory on a four manifold, if that's represented by divisor in your uh, Calabi-Yau, or in this case, some kind of three-dimensional theory on the three-manifold which has its own meaning from the three-dimensional topology point. And that's exactly what happens here. So uh, the statement that uh, we um, prove in, in this joint work with uh, Dupe, uh, Pukrov, and Tafa is that, uh, first of all, for every such graph uh, with suitable uh, assumptions that, that uh, I'm going to suppress and you can easily generalize, First of all, what you get is a conversion Q series. You get an Q expansion, just like what we saw in the, in the previous example. Uh, in general, you actually get not just one Q series, but you get several of them, which are labeled by H1 uh, data of your uh, Lagrangian submanifold. And from the viewpoint of open Gromov-Hitton theory, that's very natural. So you get this Q series. Uh, it has integer coefficients that's actually very easy to see from the sum and the integral form of this uh, counting function because uh, it involved all the ingredients with integer coefficients and it's easy to see that after summing and integrating uh, in the formula in the definition that I showed you, integrality is never spoiled. So you basically get sums of integers but never you get ratios. So you still have integer coefficient. This is important because I was aiming for something that has same features as, as Donaldson, Thomas, and Brigand. And what we just saw is that this answer is actually invariant with respect to Kirby moves. Namely, uh, if you think about this data as defining a three manifold, then what you get is independent of how you build the three manifold. So Kirby moves and topology express equivalences of different ways of building the same pre manifold, now being Lagrangian sub manifold, a special. Lagrangian set manifold. And it's good that the answer we get doesn't depend on how you build it and which order you attach handles to build non trivial topologically non trivial space. Uh, and this is a kind of interesting to QFT from the three manifold point of view because it associates Q series expansion to a three manifold rather than uh, just a number, it's actually a function of Q. And it's a new to QFT, but it has connection to well known to QFTs. If you take Q to a root of unity, it reproduces uh, quantum group invariance or WRT invariance at the roots of unity on the boundary of unit disk. So it's defined uh, inside unit disk when Q is uh, of absolute value less than one. It actually diverges. So it's important in the first statement of the theorem that Q is strictly less than one. It actually diverges on the boundary of unit disk. But if you take radial limits to roots of unity, you recover something known familiar, so it's actually good that it connects to existent TQFTs. So <coughs> in a uh, paper with Ciprian Manalescu, we generalized, uh, so this, uh, there are other ways of building three manifolds based on surgeries, and what I showed you is in some sense uh, kind of part of that story. Uh, to get the absolute more general three manifold, you want to develop the surgery calculus, which is what we did with Ciprian. And uh, surgery involves surgery on knots in, inside three sphere or three manifolds. And um, knots, in turn, correspond to spectral curves. Uh, 
or, or that they have associated spectral curves given by a zero locus of a polynomial. So uh, with Chiprian, we developed this technology, how to compute the surgery techniques based on topological recursion of this uh, a polynomial curve. This is something I'll try to uh, talk about in the following week, uh, which also nicely feeds to, to this general program. Um, but again, it's a very old subject. Uh, and um, yeah, we, we heard previous lecture uh, as well as other talks uh, telling us about uh, topological recursion. So I want to conclude uh, by asking or having children to ask the following question. So you compute this Q series for different choices of input data. I think about this again as open DT series with integer powers of Q. And once you have some function or some result which looks like Q series with integer powers of Q, you can ask, does it look like a modular form? Um, because those we also write as Q expansions uh, very naturally. So does it, I mean, what, what, what kind of object is this as a function of Q? So in the case of uh, McMahon function and, and Euler function, we of course know the answer. So Euler function is basically eta function of total Q power. And it's a, you know, it beautifully fits on the theory of modular forms. So Q expansion that you get from uh, McMahon function and its generalizations also has many interesting connections to very interesting cluster algebras and so on. Question is, what about this? Uh, here we have zillions of examples associated with different graphs and so on, different choices of Lagrangians. So the results, do they uh, have any modular properties or what kind of functions are they? So in some simpler cases, this, this question was actually answered by a nice paper by Catherine Bringman, Carl Mulberg, and uh, Anton Millish, uh, where they pointed out that um, the kind of function that you get are of the type that Romano John discovered 100 years ago. So this is his last letter to Hardy. And uh, I want to know that it was written in January 20, uh, sorry, 1920. I was going to say that now we are in 2020. So it's exactly 100 years after, and we're still in January. Today is the last day of January 2020. And um, well, what uh, Romano John discovered is a very cool class of functions. He gave about, I don't know, 20, 30 examples. Uh, of something that he believed is a tip of an iceberg, something that uh, he felt has interesting structure from the viewpoint of uh, perhaps modularity, but couldn't quite put a finger on. And this is uh, this now became very popular subject, especially in the past uh, 10, 20 years, with the development of um, false and mock uh, functions and modular forms. And uh, in fact, what I showed you even in this example is, is one of the cases that uh, Roman and John wrote in, in the letter. So this is only for a certain class of graphs, in fact, for graphs which have only one trivalent vertex, but more generally you can ask, uh, what if I change my problem and have a graph with many uh, trivalent or multiple valency vertices and so on? We still have some kind of Q-series, but um, it's not known what, what the corresponding, uh, where to put it on this uh, framework, so that's something uh, new and one of one question. And um, finally, I want to point out that uh, by looking at this closely, you notice that um, this uh, Q series turns out to be uh, to actually the, the spoiled kind of modular properties nicely feed in the theory of logarithmic vertex algebra. So conjecture, uh, which we call 3D modularity conjecture, is that always for any choice of this Lagrangian three manifold, what you're going to get is a character of logarithmic vertex algebra. So I'm running out of time. I was planning to tell you more about quantum groups and so on, but I just want to finish uh, basically saying that this leads to completely unexpected, at least for me and for us, bridge between enumerative geometry and algebra. I knew nothing uh, about vertex or logarithmic vertex algebras two years ago when, when this happened. And I still know very little, in fact, which is one of the subjects that uh, is also kind of on the forefront but of algebra, kind of similar to mod modular forms and modularity. But it seems that trying to count this open DT invariance, even in such a limited class of, of Calabiaus, already opens completely new doors and leads us to bridges that, that we didn't understand. You take
take a radial limit. So the question was, uh, how do we put a root of unit here? So indeed, what you get is a Q series. So it has form that we saw a couple of times on, on the slides. And um, it's converging. So the theorem was that it's converging strictly inside the unit disk. So it diverges on the boundary, but you can ask, what if I take the radial limit? It doesn't exist if my point here is exponential of 2 pi i divided by an integer. And in those cases, it's actually finite and coincides with the large integer. So is there a large duality in this which can be described? Right, so this is now being studied. I actually mentioned some ongoing work of the BSR home uh, by the younger uh, team involving uh, um, Sanyu Park and others, uh, which involves asking how does this whole thing behave with respect to n multiplicity and uh, connects to, to the other side. So I have little to say about it, so, but I hope one of those people will tell me something useful in the near future. So it's a good question, I don't know. So for one of the quarters, uh, can you write the, this definition of the DT? For the vertex, can you write that as an integral over a modulus? Mm -hmm. um, I can give you a tentative, uh, and another paper would give uh, kind of attempts to do it, but I hope uh, one of you can formalize it by better than that. Also, something else I wanted to comment, maybe mm -hmm. already you put it in your paper, so it kind of reminds the one dimension, one complex dimension higher version of. Shandy or Blanco construction. Um, that I don't know how it connects. If you have, if you have, if you look at the Hilbert scheme, I think Alar Stanley actually kind of wrote a paper on it. If you have a singular surface with an ADE type singularity, complex surface, then you, they, I think in the paper they were intersecting with S5 and they were getting these topological uh, three manifolds. Three score the spheres, and then uh, the, they were writing partition functions, and at some limit, they will get modular forms also for WRT rays. Well, that's uh, something interesting. So I think there are two questions. And one is to find connection, even in that case. But I want to also emphasize a second comment to that <coughs> this is, of course, not limited to three score spheres. So yes, it's not. 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 Yes, it's not.